Welcome all, I'm joined today by Dr. Pietro Shakarian, a lecturer at the American University of Armenia. He is originally from Cleveland, Ohio, and a specialist in Russian and Soviet history with a focus on Soviet Armenia and the thaw under Nikita Khrushchev. So Pietro, thank you very much for your time. Emilio, thank you for having me on your show today. It's a great pleasure. To start off, I want to ask about the legacy of the Soviet past, which is evident in Armenia. Uh, how is that past remembered, in your opinion, and interpreted in Armenia today? It's remembered in two ways. There is a one way that is very, very, you know, fondly remembered because people remember the Soviet welfare system, the Soviet social system. It was a means for mobility. People had jobs, especially like in the regions. So at one point you have a very kind of positive image of the Soviet past. On the other hand, you have people who look uh, more critically at the more uh, oppressive aspects of the Soviet rule. Uh, for instance, the period of the Stalinist purges in the 1930s, but also kind of the suppression of national dissidents and so on and so forth. So you have kind of two uh, kind of legacies. And this is something that um, with any kind of a history like this, any kind of a complicated past, you're going to have kind of conflicting uh, narratives about. But basically there are kind of two interpretations of it. What some people don't understand is that you can actually uh, have a past that incorporates both. So it's not one or the other. It doesn't have to be mutually exclusive. It wasn't that the Soviet past was 100% you know, uh, perfect and it wasn't that you know, it was all about terror and Stalin and, and so on and so forth. That in reality it's a mix of both. Like any other kind of a history, it's kind of a, you know, uh, a combination of, of elements. So it's not like one way or the other. I think that that's uh, one big takeaway that many people uh, should get from the, the Soviet experience. When we look at it critically, you find out that there are different aspects of it. There is, a, like I said, the darker aspect and also the aspect that was positive uh, for the population. I also want to ask you about Anastas Mikoyan, an Armenian who rose to the highest, highest levels of power in the Soviet Union. He was chairman of the Presidium under uh, Nikita Khrushchev. Uh, he kind of uh, exemplifies what you were talking about, this complica complicated legacy of the Soviet Union. Some say he was a great statesman uh, when it comes to Armenian interests, also the Cuban Missile Crisis, de-Stalinization. Others say he was involved in the purges that happened in Armenia in the 1930s. So how would you unpack this complex character for us? I think that you unpack Mikoyan again by looking at all the elements of Mikoyan. There are, of course, you know, you have to take the positive with the negative. You have to take the whole picture together. My research on Mikoyan specifically uh, looks at his role in the development of the post-Stalin nationality policy, which is really kind of research nobody else has done. So I've worked in archives in Armenia, I've worked in the, uh, the Central Archive, the uh, you know, Social Political Archive in, in, here in Yerevan. I've also worked in various archives in Moscow. I worked at the Russian State Archive, the Russian State Archive of Social Political History. I worked uh, in the Archive of Contemporary History, Literature Archive, and I even worked with historians at Memorial Institute who um, presented to me documents of classified materials from, say, uh, FSB archives that they were able to get access to during a brief window of kind of, uh, you know, archival access you know, to these specific documents. And they've elucidated a lot about Mikoyan's role in the 1930s. But what I would say specifically, so I look at the nationality policy, but also his role in de-Stalinization, which is incredibly important for understanding the development of democratization in the Soviet Union and in Soviet Armenia specifically. Um, so if we look at that past, uh, you cannot look at, for instance, Mikoyan's involvement in the events of 1954, uh, which is kind of this beginning of rehabilitations without looking at his earlier involvement in the, the purges in the 1930s, which I've actually found in the, uh, from the documentary evidence that he was forced into this by Stalin. Stalin was closely supervising everything from Moscow. Mikoyan was actually not directly involved in this until uh, later, that actually Stalin originally had Melenkov in there. It's a long story, I could unpack it uh, for you. Um, but uh, basically Mikoyan's role in that episode was forced, but he felt kind of a guilt for that. 
and that led him to participate in this de-Stalinization effort that included Armenia, but also the entire Soviet Union. He was very instrumental in working with Khrushchev to uh, de-Stalinize the Soviet state and remove Stalin's personality cult. It's a very important history because de-Stalinization in the Soviet context and in the context even today of the post-Soviet space is intimately associated with democratization. Mm -hmm. So if you can freely discuss this period of history, this very dark period of history of 1937 openly, then you can discuss you know, basically anything that, that this is kind of an opening for that uh, you know, that more kind of like uh, open discussions ab about, uh, you know, freedom of speech, democracy, and so on and so forth. And in 1954, Mikoyan traveled, traveled to Yerevan, where he delivered a speech and called for the rehabilitation of the writer Yerisha Char Charents. Uh, the speech occurred after uh, Stalin's death. Um, and you have written extensively. One year after Stalin's death. One year. Yeah. So you've written extensively about this speech. Why is this speech important to understand? Well, not only was it one year after Stalin's death, it was two years before Khrushchev denounced Stalin at the 20th Party Congress, the Soviet 20th Party Congress, in February 1956. So this is two years before. So basically, if we, if we look at kind of the chronology, uh, Lavrenti Beria, after he was arrested and executed, Mikoyan was beginning to receive all sorts of requests for rehabilitation from family members of people who had been repressed during the 1930s, uh, and particularly people from uh, Mikoyan's you know, Caucasian revolutionary circle, Bakuvian revolutionary circle. This included people who were ethnic Armenians, uh, Russians, Jews, Georgians, Azerbaijanis, they were requesting for Mikoyan to rehabilitate you know, their family members to bring them back from the Gulag, if, if possible, and also to clear their names. So Mikoyan uh, was receiving these letters, and then in March, uh, March 11th, 1954, he comes to Yerevan and delivers this speech, which actually has you know, two elements to it. One is about calling for a new kind of approach to the Soviet nationality policy, actually really a return to an earlier iteration of the Soviet nationality policy that is both against kind of national chauvinism, but it's also against what Mikoyan called national nihilism, the insensitivity to national concerns. And he called for the republication of the works of Rafi and Patkanyan. He called for the preservation of Miasnikan, the great Armenian uh, Soviet statesman. And he called for the rehabilitation of Charents. When he says the name Charents in the original audio, because I have it from the Armenian archives, when he says the name Charents, the entire room explodes in applause for about 40 seconds. It's a remarkable piece of audio. And at that moment, that's when uh, Charents' good friend, Regina Gazarian, she heard this speech on the radio and she was inspired to exhume the buried manuscripts of Charents from the ground and you know, have them republished. And even though Charents, was officially rehabilitated by the Soviet state in 1955. The speech of 54 sets in motion the process of rehabilitation. If you look at his file, they take the excerpt from Mikoyan's speech as part of their effort to kind of consider this, this uh, rehabilitation. But also, uh, you know, already you have by, you know, April, May 1954, People are doing recitations of Charents in Yerevan. Already you have this kind of an opening here in Yerevan. But it doesn't end there. So Mikoyan was anticipating an increase in requests for rehabilitations. And on March 18th, 1954, so think about this. He gives a speech on March 11th, 1954. March 18th, 1954, it's only a few days after. He, there is this kind of a reconsideration commission that's established in the name of Mikoyan by Soviet Armenian officials that deals with a significant number of rehabilitation cases. In fact, most of the cases that this commission uh, absorb, uh, observes and examines have to do with rehabilitation of people who have been repressed during the Stalinist period. So uh, Mikoyan uh, at that point is already kind of looking into this process and the number of requests he personally receives after he mentions Charents after the speech, already in April 1954, mushrooms. In addition to that, um, he's closely supervising the rehabilitation processes across the USSR. 
He's looking at individual rehabilitation cases. If you go to the Russian State Archive, he's looking at each individual case and he's signing off on each individual one with his characteristic blue pencil. So you have that. Plus, uh, Mikoyan was very close, going back to his Bakuvian revolutionary days, to the family of Stepan Shahumyan. And he basically, after Shahumyan's death, he adopted Shahumyan's sons as his own. So it was almost like that's how close he was to that family. And Levon Shahumyan, who was the editor of the great Soviet encyclopedia, he was Stepan's son, that basically he uh, had this apartment on the Moscow embankment, and together him and Mikoyan would have there, would host uh, these people who had returned from the Gulag. So like Alexei Snegov, or Olga Shatunovskaya, these, these really kind of, uh, you know, uh, people who were, who were um, I want to say they were re fervent revolutionaries. They were fervent believers in the, in the revolution, but they had been repressed under the Stalinist regime. And now Mikoyan with Shahumyan, together they work to persuade, to use these individuals to persuade Khrushchev to deliver his speech of February 1956 to denounce Stalin. So this is a very big piece of history that more people in Armenia should know about because Armenians in many ways, uh, and Armenia itself, was at the center of this process of de-Stalinization, of the you know, breakup of the Stalinist personality cult. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it, it's an extremely important history, extremely important history. And can you explain briefly why Charents had to be rehabilitated? Because Charents was a victim of the Stalinist terror. This is something I guess I just, you know, um, assumed, you know, but, but this is, uh, he was arrested in 1937. Mm -hmm. The context for this goes back to 1936. In 1936, the, uh, the Soviet Armenian government was run by an individual man by the name of Agassi Khanjian. And Lavrenti Beria, who was the first secretary of Georgia, had published a history of the revolution in the Caucasus. And this history of the revolution in the Caucasus uh, did not really focus on Armenians at all. It focused mostly on Georgians. It focused on Beria. It focused on Stalin. And the, many of the Armenian intellectuals at the time in Soviet Armenia were complaining, well, what about us? You know, what about like Miasnikan or Shahumyan, these great Armenian, you know, Bolshevik revolutionaries? Why aren't they discussed? And um, Beria blamed personally Khanjian for kind of encouraging this kind of dissent against his official history. And so in July 1936, Khanjian was invited to the office of Beria, and in that office, Beria shot Khanjian. We have an official Soviet investigation from 1956, this is from you know, the Russian archives, uh, that proves that Khanjian did not commit suicide, as Beria said, but that Khanjian was shot by Beria. And this period, this, this moment, opened up the doors for the terror in Armenia, or the, the Great Purge uh, in Armenia. And at that moment, uh, Beria sponsored uh, the rise of his protégés in Armenia, including First, Secreta First Secretary Amatuni Amatuni, and the head of the NKVD in Armenia. The NKVD was the KGB of the time. And the head of the NKVD in Armenia that Beria sponsored was Khachik Mogdusi, who was like the Armenian Yezhov. And Yezhov was really, really a, a bad guy who was the head of the secret police at the height of the terror. Mm -hmm. So this was the period where you had the, the worst of the terror occur in Armenia, and this is when Charens was arrested in 1937 and uh, imprisoned and actually uh, executed. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but this is kind of the, the background for, for, for that uh, episode specifically. And a lot of the challenges Armenia faces today, there is a perception that the origins of a lot of these challenges uh, are in the Soviet Union. For example, Karabakh, uh, for example, the enclaves which exist in Armenia and Azerbaijan. I'm wondering, to what extent do you think, for example, the Karabakh conflict and uh, other conflicts, perhaps even in the post-Soviet space, are a direct result of decisions that were made during the Soviet era? There is an element of uh, you know Soviet decision making that, that factored into how we got how we ended up with Karabakh, but it also the origins go back much further than this. 
So you could say that the origins of the Karabakh conflict can go all the way back to the 18th century with uh, you know, basically the incorporation of what we today know as mountainous Karabakh, Artsakh, into the Karabakh Khanate. Right? So when this was joined, then suddenly you had this association between the lowland Karabakh and the highland Karabakh, mm -hmm. uh, or what became known as the highland Karabakh. So you have that. Uh, but then also in the immediate period of kind of the Russian Civil War in the Caucasus, you also had uh, the fact that um, you had Antronik who was about to take Karabakh, but then he was stopped by the British, and the British instead uh, assigned Karabakh or mountainous Karabakh, Artsakh, to uh, Musavat, Azerbaijan. And so um, that almost set the stage. There's a great scholar, Arsen Saparov, who has written about this, that in some ways the establishment of uh, the Azerbaijani control over Artsakh in this period um, led to the outcome of it becoming part of Soviet Azerbaijan. So in other words, by the time the Soviets came into uh, the Caucasus, uh, they were confronted with the situation that Artsakh, even though majority Armenian, was under Azerbaijani control or surrounded by areas that were under Azerbaijani control. So it made sense then to make it autonomous within uh, Azerbaijan or to kind of uh, maintain an arrangement like that. So you have, you know, scenarios like this, but also I say that there's an element of Soviet decision making in it because uh, there was a uh, effort originally by the Soviet government to have Karabakh be incorporated in Soviet Armenia. They even had a vote on this issue and uh, it was voted, it was decided to make Karabakh, and even Miasny Khan voted for this, to make Karabakh a part of Soviet Armenia, the, the Soviet Armenian Republic. But then this vote was mysteriously reversed, and suddenly it was incorporated as an autonomous oblast into Soviet Azerbaijan. The re reasons for this include Nadimanov's pressure on Soviet authorities not to change the situation and to keep Karabakh within Soviet Azerbaijan. You know, there was, there's you know, he was, uh, for instance, threatening, you know, to halt oil supplies, this sort of a thing. You also have the, uh, so, uh, Georgi Dorlugian, who you know well, who's been on this uh, program, he has talked about, he was uh, referring to a historian in Moscow who was talking about uh, how some Georgian Bolsheviks, as a matter of fact, including Stalin, how they felt that if we assign Karabakh or transfer Karabakh to Soviet Armenia, then it would set a precedent for Abkhazia and South Ossetia. So there are these uh, elements of the Soviet policy making that factor into this as well. Um, as for the enclaves, this was a very kind of a complicated process that involved delineating the borders along both ethnographic and economic lines to make sure that each republic had you know, enough economic resources that it corresponded more or less with ethnographic boundaries mm -hmm. that were, you know, based on the boundaries, uh, ethnographic maps of the Caucasus from the Tsarist era or from this period of time. Mm -hmm. So there was an effort to try and make boundaries that would kind of be more or less uh, acceptable to everybody. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and, and actually in, involved in this process was the famous Armenian writer Axel Bakuns. That actually he was irresponsible in many cases, even though some people say, well, some areas, for instance, in Zangazor, in Sunik, could have gone to Armenia. In many cases, Bakuns was uh, instrumental in securing more favorable terms for certain areas to be incorporated into Zangazor or to be left within Zangazor. Uh, you know, Sunik in, in the 1920s. So this was a whole uh, process. It wasn't just a simple matter of, you know, the Bolsheviks from on high in Moscow, you know, made this proclamation and they did this maybe with some sort of, you know, malicious intent. There, was, there were all sorts of kind of interests and considerations, as there are in any form of politics, uh, behind how certain boundaries and territories ended up in the jurisdiction of certain areas. And in some cases, you had a uh, point where a territory that might have been part of Soviet Azerbaijan, but that was majority Armenian, would have been transferred to Soviet Armenia, while a territory that was majority Azeri uh, would have been transferred uh, to Soviet Azerbaijan from Soviet Armenia. So you had kind of maybe some switching of territories uh, in this period in the, in the 1920s during the new economic policy. Nope.
And during the Soviet era, different, different ethnic groups, different uh, national groups coexisted in relative peace. How did the Soviet Union achieve this in your opinion? How were they able to kind of keep a lid on ethnic tensions? And a big way in which they were able to do this was by having that arbiter in Moscow kind of uh, mediate uh, between these kind of different like national disputes that would maybe periodically emerge, right? But you also have to think that on an individual level, on the level not so much of elites, but on the level of common people, many people got along because they had been already for centuries getting along. You have to think that before the ethno-territorial state was established, there were no real kind of boundaries between, let's say, this is Armenia, this is you know Azerbaijan, that sort of a thing, that under the czarist state, let's say, or the imperial Russian state rather, you had uh, you know, whole provinces that had mixed populations of people. And so people more or less kind of coexisted, and in most of the places in the Caucasus, most of the places with Armenians and Azerbaijanis, or Tatars as they were earlier known, uh, they got along relatively well. But it was in Karabakh where this issue, political issue of status was kind of unresolved, that you had the most tension, as a matter of fact. There was always kind of this tension just underneath the surface in Artsakh Karabakh it, itself, because the Armenians never fully accepted the fact that they were part of Azerbaijan, and the Azerbaijani, uh, you know, the Baku authorities never fully accepted the fact that mountainous Karabakh Artsakh was autonomous or should be autonomous even within Azerbaijan. That should just be administered directly by Baku. Um, so there was always that kind of a tension underneath the surface, but. Emilio, the fact that you had an arbiter in Moscow, that was a major reason why they were able to kind of keep a, a, you know, a lid on the tensions. Plus, also during the period of you know, high Stalinism, high authoritarianism in the Soviet Union, the sheer force of the state and the kind of the um, threat of uh, the force of the state was enough to kind of keep nationalities in line to some extent as well too. I don't want to mitigate that. but. Um, in, in by and large, a lot of it had to do with the fact that you have this central power that's able to kind of mediate between, you know, uh, you know, different ethnic groups and different nationalities, and that was a major factor in kind of keeping the peace, uh, you know, so to speak. That's why even today, when we look at kind of the ceasefire, uh, ceasefires that have happened in Karabakh, they've been Russian negotiated, mm -hmm. by and large, or Russian uh, mediated, uh, and this again shows that even without the fact that. Armenia and Azerbaijan are not part of the same state as Russia, Russia still continues to act as a sort of regional referee. And this is um, a, a legacy that goes back you know, uh, to even the period of imperial Russian rule to some extent. And my final question is two prompt. First off, uh, what were some of the positives about Soviet rule in Armenia? And finally, do you think in the future we might see a revisionism or a rehabilitation even of the image of the USSR in Armenia? I think uh, when we talk about the positives, the biggest one that most Armenians will tell you about, especially if you go to the regions, is that there were job opportunities. Uh, to a large degree, development was spread out. Not just, it was not so much concentrated in Yerevan, but there was an effort by the Soviet government to really expand development to places like, say, Sisian or Ijivan or Leninakan, today or, or Gyumri. All these areas, there was a real effort by the Soviet state to spread development outside of Yerevan because there was a sense that Yerevan is located, if we look at it in the context especially of the Soviet Turkish border, not just Soviet Armenian border, but, or Soviet. Um, excuse me, not just in the context of the, um, pardon me, we'll have to edit this, but not just in the context of the Armenian-Turkish border, but also in the context of the Soviet-Turkish border, um, that the fact that Turkey, uh, you know, for instance, in the 1930s had been kind of cozying up to Nazi Germany, and then later on during the, you know, 40-year Cold War, that it was part of the NATO military alliance, there was always a concern that if you know, God forbid Turkey were to attack, they could easily take Yerevan because it's so close to the Turkish border, and then that would be the end of the whole republic. The idea of spreading the resources out in two different regions and two different cities in the regions uh, had the impact of developing the republic as a whole, not just Yerevan. So this was, you know, a major benefit of the Soviet system, and people remember that, that they had a means for mobility throughout the whole republic, not just in Yerevan, let's say, but throughout the whole republic. There were jobs 
in Armenia. There were, there, the, actually, the population in Armenia was growing uh, in the Soviet era. So um, that's a, a major positive that, that people remember to this day, that there was a social system. And again, you don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. You can have democracy, but you can also have at the same time a, you know, a good social system. It doesn't have to be an either or choice where you have to have like a total you know, uh, you know, capitalism where there's no regulations. You can have a system that is uh, sensitive to social welfare, but at the same time free and democratic and, and open. And so I think that that's where kind of the balance needs to be struck. But that I think would be a major positive you could take out of the Soviet period. As for how the Soviet period is remembered, the biggest issue, as I see it, is that the Soviet era in Armenia has actually been understudied in the Armenian context. Like I said, we have two polar visions of it. But these are just two polar narratives that have not been uh, really critically examined, shall we say. That there's not been a really kind of an effort to critically, I mean there have been a few, but it has not been, um, there has not been many of them, to critically examine the Soviet past. To do a good critical historical analysis of what the Soviet past means for Armenia. Because you have to think, Emilio, this was a 70 year period that had an immense impact on what we now today know as the post-Soviet Republic of Armenia, including you know, the city of Yerevan and, and all these regions. So I think when we look at it, I think that there will be eventually a, a kind of a critical examination of this, especially now in Armenian, in the examination of Armenian history in Armenia itself, the big focus is the genocide in the First Republic. Eventually there will be a time when there will be an interest in moving beyond that and toward uh, the study of the Soviet past as well. Especially as the Soviet past recedes more and more into the history, there will be more of an interest in, in studying how did we get to this point that we're in right now. And that, I think, uh, will happen eventually, but um, um, I think that for right now Armenian scholarship is mostly focused, like I said, on certain topics. Genocide, First Republic, these sorts of things. And hopefully, you know, the, the other good thing, too, about studying the Soviet past is it allows Armenians to better understand relations with Russia. It allows them to better understand that they were part of the state that also included Georgia, Azerbaijan, all these other countries as well, all these other republics, and to kind of better foster dialogue with these countries as well, too, because the history of the Soviet past is not just the history of Soviet Armenia, or it's simply not, as I would even say, like, if we look at Russia, a lot of Russian scholars look at the Soviet past through the prism of Moscow and Leningrad. They, they, they are not looking at these other republics as well. There is immense benefit that can be reaped by having a dialogue across these republics about what the Soviet past meant. Because this is such an, a fascinating and interesting history. Um, and it tells you a lot about how we got, like I said, to the, or where we are today, that um, you need that, it, that to have kind of that uh, so-called cross-fertilization uh, of, of historical study among the republics, that I think would be most beneficial, including here in Armenia. Well, Dr. Shakarian, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Emilio. It's a pleasure. Thank you. And continue following us on CivilNet.